As Matthias said, I am uh, Andreas Yllenhammer and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for Sweco. You might know about Sweco. Uh, in Sundsvall, we're situated right next to here, actually, just a couple of blocks away. And uh, we are one of the larger uh, technological uh, consultants uh, in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, we are about 9,500 consultants working together now with, with a mission to contribute to sustainable development of the society. So uh, this is really central to, to our business uh, concerning the connection here between business and sustainability. And uh, you saw the title there in, in the program that was in Swedish for my talk, and, but uh, I, I made a very freely translation over to English here because this is actually what I think is my main message to you to get today, that uh, you all know that sustainability isn't going really good at the moment. And I will show you some images on, on and stories about uh, why I think we're heading in the wrong direction. But also why we are in the super position at the moment when IT is breaking through even into uh, city planning to actually force this into a better development of the society. So I think we're in, in a good position and you are working with things that are really central to this strategy. So uh, I will show you that now. Uh, let's start by looking at this, uh, the globe. We're, we're putting kind of a, a puzzle together here. So working with it like a puzzle, you can see that the pieces need to fit together. And since I'm the starting uh, speaker of this uh, conference, I will give you one, my piece in the center here, and then you can fill up. Why do I think that we are heading in the wrong direction? Well, we can look at the way that we do things nowadays. This is an image from a, a typical high-rise building in Hong Kong. Uh, when we do things now, we don't do them really smart. We don't do it together. We do it separately. And this is just one example of all these air-conditional units that you cling to a window and, and why not do it one by one instead of trying to think in a larger, smarter picture. And this is not insignificant. I, in just a matter of maybe 10, 20 years, this will be a, a major contribution to uh, carbon emissions all over the world because the earth is, is uh, getting warmer and we are putting these up in, in larger and larger numbers. And you can see that this has the same uh, system set up, basically not a system set up. Uh, this is Hong Kong and this is what is ha happening at the moment. I will give you a story about China that I've been working with. We do a lot of projects in China now when it comes to eco city planning. And uh, if we don't do the shift now, we will be in a really locked-in position when it comes to sustainable development. So how are we doing in Europe? Well, this is a typical transportation situation in Europe. Uh, I think this is Nuremberg in Germany. And this is also to show that we have started to build ourselves stuck into a system which is not sustainable. Uh, we still, this is the year 2013, travel one by one in these cars that weigh up to 1,000 kilos and we weigh maybe 75, 80 kilos, uh, working with a, a motor, an engine that is uh, built on a 150-year-old principle of combustion and, and uh, losing energy all the way to transporting ourselves from A to B. And uh, it's really hard to, to shift this because, uh, as you know, uh, we are working with cars and car technology, but... Uh, looking at the time limit for when we have to do this shift of sustainable development, we don't have that time to do all this silly transportation that we are doing at the moment. And then we're coming to maybe the greatest obstacle at the moment, which is climate change. I would say that uh, sustainable development is going in the right direction in many ways, but uh, there is a time limit, and that has to do with climate change. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. I will, I will keep it really short because otherwise I could talk about this forever. I have a background as a scientist uh, from Uppsala University, working with the climate change and uh, aquatic ecosystems. So I, I, I did my PhD there, working with aquatic systems in, in the Baltic Sea and in Africa and, and in the Swedish mountains. And we saw that climate is the main driver for a lot of natural ecosystem uh, processes and we have adapted to a, a climate that if we change it really fast things will go really bad. Uh, this is one of the most famous climate scientists in the world, uh, James Hansen from NASA. Uh, he said in 1988 when it was the first time that the American Congress uh, summoned 
a lot of scientists to, to get a hearing about the uh, scientific effects, scientific knowledge about climate change. And uh, he had worked for a number of years on, on uh, these climate models to show that the effects could be really detrimental to Earth. And he said that, well, we now know that humans are causing climate change and we can also describe the effects quite good. Uh, this was in 1988. And uh, uh, Congress uh, took him uh, for uh, interrogations 20 years later in, in 2008. 2008. You can see that he's become older now and he has also been hit hard by the oil industry and others that try to convince that this is not happening at the moment. So he was again summoned to, to summarize science and he said that, well, as you see, it's exactly 20 years by chance actually that he was there. And he said, well, uh, there are striking similarities and he showed them the science and what has, uh, his uh, models showed. And then he also said that there is one big difference. And that is that we have now used up all slack in the schedule for actions needed to defuse the global warming time bomb. So uh, he was really annoyed by this message not reaching through. And he couldn't by that time uh, understand why things weren't moving in the right direction since there was a very serious message going on there. So uh, talking about the role of scientists, you know, you are, many of you are scientists and you know that you're actually only uh, producing science for society and not telling society what to do with the information. That's, that's the role of politicians and, and other stakeholders. But as a scientist, when you get a certain knowledge, you can also be really frustrated. And for James Hansen, when he started to realize the effects of climate change, he said that, well, if this is to be a scientist that I cannot, cannot move further on out into to the societal arena, uh, he has to do the shift. So he quit NASA. And uh, he's now working as a climate activist, you can say. He's still doing research, but uh, this was uh, two years ago when he was arrested outside the White House, uh, protesting for the Keystone Pipeline, which is supposed to transport oil from Canada to US. It's not been built yet, but uh, there's heavy political discussions about it. So uh, we are not really realizing the, the, scientific, the, the impacts of the scientific uh, information here. But uh, uh, politicians, they know about climate change. For example, George Bush, he did a lot. You can have a look here and see. And now a special address from the President of the United States on global warming. Hello, America. It's me, your, your president, your commander in chief of the world. And I'm here at my, my ranch here in Crawford, Texas, just just taking a little R&R, &R, you know, relaxing, growing out my soul patch, playing a little frisbee golf with Condi Rice and Dick Cheney, having a good time, but, but still keeping my eye on the ball. And there's an issue that has come to my attention, the issue of the so-called global warmings that are happening on our, our planet. For centuries, the rays of the sun have warmed the surface of our Earth's crust, and uh, apparently those rays are, are intensifying in such a way that uh, it's increasing lava flows. <laughs> and, uh, cut. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> Global warming is an issue that my administration is, is very concerned about deeply. Deeply in a deep kind of concerned way. It's uh, I don't, I start my day and I think about the warming of the globe and how we can get it warmer. Cut. When you think back to biblical times, when Adam and Eve talked to that snake 6,000 years ago, when the world was created, it was hot back then too. Why do you think Adam and Eve were naked? You see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. You know, you didn't, you didn't hear Adam and Eve running around talking about emission standards or hybrid cars. In fact, Adam and Eve drove an excursion. Cut. I think the polar ice caps suck. Who cares about having a place where a bunch of penguins can have an orgy? Cut. Global warming, don't worry about it. we we got a beat on this thing. We're going to, you know, we just need to get nature to cooperate with us. We don't need to listen to nature. Nature needs to listen to us. Cut. 
Well, my, that was Will Ferrell, though, but, uh, but still it was quite close to the truth. And my message is that we cannot really hope for the politicians to take long-term actions when it comes to these sustainability issues. And I will also show you what happened in Rio last summer when there was a big UN meeting, the Rio Plus 20 meeting. So the introduction is that uh, we are currently at the time when, when there is really a need for smarter solutions here. Let's move to China. Uh, one of my first assignments uh, at SWEC as a consultant when I, when I quit uh, researching uh, was to go to the city of Kunming. Kunming is in uh, southwestern China here, uh, close to the borders of, of Tibet and uh, bordering down here to, to uh, India and other uh, countries. The, the, it's, it's situated in the province of Yunnan. Kunming used to be about one million people, and they have grown to be maybe five, five and a half million in a very short time. And they are heading towards eight million people in just a couple of years. So there are more than uh, three, four hundred pe thousand people moving into the city every year now at the moment. And uh, you can also see the watershed here, which is quite limited, and uh, the, the load from the human population here is, is immense. This uh, lake here, the Dianxi Lake. It's uh, about the size of uh, between Van and Vetten. So it's quite small com compared to looking at the, the load from uh, uh, untreated wastewater from 5 million people that is flowing into this lake. And then you can imagine the, the effects of that water flowing down further into the system. And that's also only one of these uh, streams in China at the moment that is so polluted. They say that about a third of the, the water streams in, in China is so polluted that, polluted that you cannot touch them. They are, they are, they are uh, so dangerous. Uh, but my assignment here was to help them with city planning and show them uh, digital tools to do this together uh, in order to connect all the systems in, in the city. Uh, they, they're building a lot there, as I told you, and, and they're building quite good and quite fast and quite uh, good-looking architectural, but energy-wise, these are not really good buildings. They have the energy uh, performance about a third of, of the Swedish typical house when it comes to, to uh, insulation and those systems. Uh, and and the, the city will grow all the way up to the mountains here. There are these buildings all the way. Uh, I just came home now from, a, from an international conference in Toronto where I was talking to one of the uh, Chinese city plannings there. And she said that, well, we talk about China a lot and we talk about it, uh, everyone knows that things are moving fast. But she said, what we don't realize is that it's moving really, really fast. So she gave me a few numbers that I will show you here. Uh, 350 million people are moving into the cities in China. There will be 1 billion people living in cities uh, in, the, in the coming 17 years. Uh, we will have about 50,000 skyscrapers to be built there, which is 10 New York City. And the, the economy is, ex is expected to, to expand a factor of five. So then we, we also realize that, that China is, is making this or breaking this for, for a lot of us. Uh, and I went straightly to that lake there to, to have a look, because that was, of course, very interesting to see how how uh, I've never seen, I've been working with environmental issues and aquatic systems in, in Europe, but uh, we have another scale of, of, of the situation there. So, so it was completely green, uh, and it was looking like spinach soup or something. And, but this is still the lake that you have to use for everything, whether it's bathing or washing clothes or, or so. So you're actually soaked in, in chemicals in these kinds of systems. And it's heading out of control, really. Uh, but as I said, they are expanding. So what will happen? What will maybe make China move in the right direction? Because there's a lot of signs that they are. Uh, well, I think this, is, this will, will really start to, to change things. And uh, that is when the economy is hit. And the economy is hit at the moment. Uh, this is a new report uh, from China. So it's the official numbers that shows that the direct cost now for pollution is uh, about 2.5% of GDP. And that cost has doubled. Uh, and you can really uh, start to add things here. If you add the ecosystem damages, it will add another percent to that. And the cost is also increasing more than the GDP growth. So you can see that if, if they are going to fix it, it just becomes more and more expensive all the time. And the World Bank that has started to, to add the health cost of this uh, can see that it adds up to, to even more. 
what you don't see really here is that this is an airplane here. Uh, this is the, the airport of, of uh, Beijing, where they have started to, to shut down the airport. This is from, from January uh, this year, uh, when the airport was shut down for, for eight hours because that the, the visibility was so low. So the health effects are, are there, and uh, you, can, you can see that they are starting to adjust the politics very much. So let me start to, okay, now have you seen the problems, you know, the scale and the intensity, and you know that there is an imperative for sustainable development. We have to move from these kind of systems and cities that we are uh, getting stuck into, into, if you take an idealized picture of, of how a city should look, it could be like this, this could be Sundsvall actually, looking a bit like that. Well, you don't have the mountains, so let's say it's Östersund, where I come from, it's, it's more uh, appropriate, or Trondheim maybe. Uh, at Sweco, we've made this uh, imaginatory town or city to visualize what we need to do. Uh, cities today and societies today are linear systems. It means that you take in a lot of resources here, and you have the city as an engine where you produce uh, goods and services, but you move out a lot of waste here. So you build up with, with the non-renewable resources and you produce a lot of waste. Uh, what we need to do is, is quite simple. We need to take this linear city and turn it into a, uh, a looped city, where we have different loops. Uh, the main three loops that we see is uh, energy, water and waste. If we can do this uh, in a more sustainable way, but not only in separate systems, but also trying to connect them. So waste can be transformed into energy, which can be transported by water uh, and so on then we can start to see that we are lowering the load on the environment. And that is uh, quite a simple explanation, but it has really uh, tough uh, implications for how we're doing things. It means that all these different actors in the, the city planning of today need to sit down together and work together. Which means that the architect that used to be focused on buildings and houses cannot be that anymore. He has to be aware of all the different systems that are around him in the city. Uh, it, he needs to take account of uh, a lot of the other uh, competencies in, in, the, in the city planning. So moving around in this uh, city, we can also see how these systems tie in together. We have the energy, which is uh, one of the main loops. It has to be renewable in the future. Uh, we, we have to go away from fossil fuels, you all know that. But we can also find a lot of energy smart solutions in, within the city. If we look at the, the neighborhood context, we can start to mix uh, heat and cold systems and, and store them into the ground. But also, when we are producing this waste, as I said, that there will be always be some waste, we can transform it back into energy. For example, this biogas production that we can be fed out into the transportation systems and moved into the city again. Uh, and we are starting to get this picture, and we're starting to move in that direction, definitely. Uh, so where's the next uh, border for, for this? Well, I think that the next border is uh, uh, what we're talking about here. And it has to do with looking at the city as having a new layer of infrastructure, which is the IT layer. Uh, the next view of what, what we did was to complement this city with this picture to saying that we know now that there's a lot of information flowing around us. And if we can start ta to tap into that uh, big data to optimize and, and do things more efficiently, that is probably the way in, in the future to build a sustainable city. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the concept. And this is a concept that you can either hate or love. Uh, or, or you can do as me to both hate and love it in, in a sense there. I, I, I like the, the meaning of it, but I also hate the way that it's used and the delusion of the concept of sustainability that is going on at the moment. And it's really hard to aim for sustainability because you don't know what it means. So I will do a, a quick recap to show you the, the scientific basis, but also then move into what's happening with the concept at the moment because it is really developing fast. It started about here, in the 80s, when Gro Holland Brundtland set down this very simple explanation that showed that we have to live in a way that doesn't make it impossible to live in the future. Okay, that's really easy to, to grasp, but she also said that there are three dimensions of this. 
and there's the environmental dimension. That means that we have to keep within the planetary boundaries. Okay, that's the really simple one, but it's also the most important one, I would say, because if we don't take care of this, well, it doesn't really matter what we do with the rest of it. And uh, uh, you might have heard of, of Peter Stordalen, which is the, the hotel uh, uh, owner of, of Clarion and so on. He used to say that there is no business on a dead planet, and it really doesn't matter if we do. Uh, this one's good if we are destroying the, the presuppositions of, of, of our society. Economic sustainability is often misunderstood, I would say. A lot of people connect this to, to, to growth directly or to, to have a net profit in your company. But it's not. It actually has no, no things to do with, with money. If you read the Brundtland report, which is actually really boring, so don't do it. But if you would do it, you can see that uh, she doesn't say that, uh, well, we should use capitalism, we should use socialism or, or any other system. She just tells talks about that we need to be efficient and we need to be economic with our human capital and material resources. So that is what we need to conserve. And then you can start to talk about things like doing things in a life cycle cost analysis. We can talk about green growth, wi which is decoupling uh, growth from emissions. And energy efficiency is definitely economic sustainability. And we also talk about the human sustainability in this sense that we need to have a work-life balance and not deplete our, our human resources. Uh, so this is the economic dimension in its essence. Social sustainability is about the people and that we need to have a society where we can, can fulfill our basic needs. And this is our basic needs. It's not about the, the, a certain materiality standard or so. It's about uh, working with things that, that uh, makes us, us feel good and that we are included in society. And it has a lot of meanings today when it comes to uh, the distribution of wealth and those systems. So here we're talking about other things. We're talking about freedom. You see the softer values here. And this has been maybe a tricky dimension for, for, for technologists because we work with things and we work with uh, hard systems. But we need to keep in, in the back of our head that if we don't do this for humans or for, for our societal needs, well, there's really no use of, of figuring out a lot of things if, if it doesn't contribute to this. So why do business care about this and how can business capture the value in sustainability? Well, at first, let's just uh, be clear on that there is a, a real business case on sustainability. Uh, I work a lot with scanning the, the, the globe for for these businesses, you can call it uh, clean tech, uh, green technology, or, or sustainable business and so on. And it's really growing. It's growing faster than, than other business areas. And also there's a lot of studies coming out now that say we're starting to reach a tipping point uh, when it comes to growth of sustainable business. And it has a lot to do with that we are reaching cost parity for renewable energy. Uh, this is a Swedish consultant that was working before me a lot with the, our energy companies. He's called Magnus Enel. Uh, he tried to formulate the business case for, for sustainable development like this, that uh, it has to do with the, the responsibility of your business. And if you take that responsibility, there's a lot of, of, of gaining to have. Uh, and I tried to complement this picture by, by uh, formulating these different aspects of the business case. I would say that uh, at first what you see when you start to work with sustainability is that you can lower a lot of costs. It has to do with optimization and, and resource efficiency. If you, for example, are working in a, a mattress factory and you do this as uh, business development with sustainability, you can see that, well, maybe we can cut uh, our dependency on, on a lot of resources here and, and use spill more efficiently. We can also start to, to find these loops within our own industry, which means that you can cut costs. Uh, you minimize risks. Uh, thinking through what you really are doing means that you also can uh, protect yourself from, from future legislation. You can prote protect yourself from, from climate change and, and uh, extreme weather and so on. And of course, uh, rising prices on, on fossil fuels. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on this. Brand value. If you talk a lo lot about sustainability, People get interested in you and, and they want to pay more for products and services that they think are sustainable. 
but if you only do this, there's a quite a high risk also because uh, uh, society is getting more and more knowledgeable about sustainability, which means that if you only talk brand and, and actually don't fill up with a lot of actions, well, there's a risk that you will end up in the greenwashing bucket. This is really important for us in Sweden and, and as uh, working with uh, people that are highly educated. Uh, they don't want to, to work for companies that don't take this seriously. And we see that a lot at Sweco. The, the new consultants that we get in that are born in the 80s, they are really serious about this. So if we don't really meet up to their expectations, they will go to another one. Uh, because work and, and life is not separated in that sense nowadays, as you know. Well, as a PhD student, uh, it has never been, actually. Work and, and life is kind of the same all day around. My professor used to say, well, wh when I talked about a heavy workload, he said, well, you know, Andreas, the, the, the day we, ha we have 24 hours. That's what we have. So it's not like we had eight hours or so that I would hope you would say, but what's 24? Uh, okay, and then we have the overall business case. Overusing a lot of resources, uh, pushing this down to staying within the planetary boundaries. This is the greatest business opportunity at all because it needs a lot of change. And we, we live on change in a way. Uh, but what is happening with the concept? That was the basis and the reasons for business to, to be a part of this. Uh, well, it is changing, as I said. These three dimensions haven't always been equal. It started with the environmental sustainability, and that was where we did a lot of work in, in Sweden and Europe. And we cleaned up a lot of local mess, so to say. Uh, then we saw the rise of economic sustainability, and that had to do with technology development in the late 90s. But what we're seeing now is the the comeback of social sustainability. Uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, this is really high up, where we start to see that uh, cities like uh, Copenhagen, even Stockholm, London, is heavily affected by uprising and, and social unrest, so to say. So we need to take care of this, and we need to, to find the way that through uh, to, to solve poverty. Uh, I, I met a, a professor that said poverty is our greatest environmental degradation, because that also gives a lot of pollution, and it's a waste of resources in many ways. We can also, in Sweden, if we look more to our, our market, we can see a rise of, of business ethics on the agenda. Uh, Milton Friedman, a, a famous uh, economist, he used to say that the business of business is business. You shouldn't care about anything else. You shouldn't care about the social issues and so on. Uh, that is not really true anymore. And we see that businesses that doesn't take care of, of other things and the responsibility for its effects uh, will be judged. And this, we have a lot of examples with Stora Enso, Telia Sonera and others that, that see that it doesn't only affect the value of, of the company, it also can, can mean the end of their own business. Uh, so it's getting high up on the agenda and media has started to really find these uh, guys and, and hunt them down. Uh, but if we, if we stay a bit around the concept of responsibility, we can see that it isn't really as easy as they thought. Because if you take responsibility for what's in your house, uh, people seem to be not so satisfied with that. Because uh, we can take the example of the, uh, the horse meat scandal in Europe and Sweden, where you found a lot of horse meat within our meatballs. It shouldn't contain horse meat, it should contain only beef. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it has to do with all these complicated ways that, uh, that is the production of a meatball today. And if IKEA is hit by this scandal, uh, people really don't care that IKEA wasn't the producer of the meatball. They had it uh, outsourced to Dovgård, that had it outsourced to a Danish company, that had it outsourced to a Polish uh, horse uh, company. And then suddenly, in, in some way here, things went wrong. And, and the only thing that the consumer care about is that IKEA can guarantee their meatballs. And this is really shaking up a lot of the industry in Sweden at the moment. How far do you need to go down to check uh, your downstream activities and your upstream activities as well? Uh, other large companies that work a lot with this is uh, Hennes Mauritz, for example. Uh, because people want to know that their uh, cotton is okay. And then, as I said, with the, with the Will Ferrell... Uh, sketch there that it's really hard now when it comes to sustainability to get a lot of uh, 
devotion from politicians. We, we can't really see the long-term commitment that would be needed to, to get uh, a good playground for sustainability. And as I said, the concept and the word is getting diluted and uh, connecting it back to science again. We can see that the scientists working with sustainability is starting to get really pessimistic about the future of the concept. Uh, they, uh, the World Watch Institute, which uh, every year uh, write a state of the world report, they said that, well, we are entering the era of sustainable now. It's not sustainability. Everyone talks about it, but if we look at the trends, it doesn't really move the right direction. So, uh, where do we see the good signs? Well, if we move back one year and go to, to Rio de Janeiro, there was the United Nations uh, top meeting on sustainable development. And they are really firm and say that this has to be our main focus for the coming years. It will be. So we're not releasing sustainable development as our overarching goal here. Uh, I went to Rio because uh, Sveco was invited as one of the uh, business representatives from Sweden to contribute with what we know about building sustainable cities. So I went to Rio as one of four representatives in that group. It was Ericsson, there was Saab, and, and there was a uh, a woman working with uh, space design, so to say, Cecilia Hatch, and then there was me. Uh, so we were contributing in different uh, arenas during the Rio meeting, uh, talking about sustainable development. I would also say that this was, this was really a good uh, opportunity to get to talk with a lot of good people that you don't reach. You cannot phone Reinfeldt in Sweden and, and arrange a meeting, but uh, here it was one of 190 high representatives, and then they kind of dilute each other, so suddenly you can reach him and you can talk with him about what we see and what is important for us. Uh, and there was an agreement. Uh, there's always an agreement on, on these UN meetings, and they make a lot of papers. Uh, this was a report that was uh, 193 pages, I think, and, and it was a lot of about we, we aim to for sustainable development in all of the world. We can agree on that. And uh, it's important. It's good for us. And we only have one Earth. That, that kind of gets into every paper, that we only have one Earth. Yeah, we know. Uh, but they were happy. But uh, there is no firm action in this, because that's what cannot be agreed upon. You can see what they're talking about, and you can, you can kind of get the sense that it's moving, in the sense that we're talking a lot about the green economy nowadays. Uh, so the concept is shifting, and we're also talking about corporations more, that they need to report on this. Uh, talking about gender equality, uh, talking about financing in this, and how to measure sustainability. Can, can we go beyond GDP as a, as a main uh, well-being uh, measurement? And also, can, what, what can we do that is not committed other than, than voluntary? What I would say is that was the main takeaway from the Rio meeting, because uh, this was 20 years after the original founding meeting of sustainable development, uh, the concept there, is that there is a shift of focus going on now. People don't really think that the solution is within this group, because they, they seem to, the process is so difficult and complicated that you cannot solve it with a top-down approach. Uh, but what is happening is that you can also see that corporations and businesses that were there really have the solution nowadays. We don't talk about the need for new technology. We have the technology for sustainable development. We know how to design a, a zero emission city. Uh, we can do all these things, but what we need to do is to scale up, as was the, uh, the theme of this conference that I went to, the business day in Rio. We need to scale up uh, existing solutions and we need to speed up. Uh, for example, there were corporations there like Disney, for example, you know, the media uh, company. Uh, they've been waiting a lot for, for a, a carbon tax in the US that would make them do the shift towards uh, lower emissions. US haven't implemented the carbon tax yet, but Disney wouldn't want to wait. So they started to make their own tar carbon tax system within Disney. And suddenly they got a really good shift towards lowering emissions and lowering costs for, for their travels and, and other things. So you can see that business that step ahead, they get more comp competitive. We also saw that uh, nations used to be a main driver of, of a lot of, of, of questions, but they are so bogged down now with, with the day-to-day with the -day 
administration of a country. So you cannot really go to, co to national politicians and say, yeah, we, we need to do something more long term here. And they say, yeah, we just have to, to, to solve the unemployment issue first. And if you go to Greece or, or, or Italy or Spain, you can imagine that they just say, wait, wait we cannot handle anything more than, than what's up the economic crisis. So nations are not delivering really. Uh, what we see is that cities are delivering. So it is a scale down o even on the geographical scales where cities, especially the larger ones, uh, that have the economic power and they have uh, le legislative power to, to start to do things. This is in Vancouver. I was in Vancouver two years ago and, and looked a lot into the, what they are doing at the moment. Because they have put up a, an action plan that says that we are going to be the greenest city in the world in 2020. And that's the easy part to set up that uh, document. But they really want to do it. And it started with the mayor that showed a leadership that said that, well, we need to do it. So there was a uh, proposition that they were going to double the motorway capacity into the downtown Vancouver here. And he said that, no, we cannot do that. Because if we build for more traffic, there will be more traffic. And then the city kind of realized that he was serious about it. So now they're moving ahead on all these goals. And they have lowered emissions. They have put up a high building standards. You cannot get a building permit in Vancouver if you are not going for the highest LEED certification system in uh, LEED Gold there. And they're also pushing away traffic and uh, uh, promoting space for, for bike travel. Uh, they are narrowing streets that used to be for cars you know, with more green spaces and, and more spaces for people. Uh, they are implementing a lot of these smart solutions for, for car sharing, car, uh, car pooling. Uh, they get the best uh, uh, places to stay. And also they are saving space in the downtown economic district for people to move around and, and for housing to be put up. And they have a lot of urban farming to just show that we are part of nature here. Uh, there are things happening, definitely. Uh, and they are innovative in the sense that they try solutions that seems really strange. This is a... a, a a high rise in, in Vancouver that they completely covered in glass. You can see there's an old building inside and they said, that, hey, what, what will be the, the energy efficiency here if we just cover it in glass? And they evaluate and said that, well, that didn't work. And then they try something else. But they move ahead and they're not afraid to check for, for innovative solutions. They're working a lot with the science. And this is the, the university there in, in, in Vancouver that they work a lot with. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what's next when it comes to sustainable cities. I think this is it. Uh, working with, with building societies, there's a lot of, of uh, friction, you can say. It takes a lot of time. You can imagine uh, going just to Sundsvall and see how, how much has changed in Sundsvall the last five years when it comes to traffic and, and buildings and, and development. Well, I would say not so much because it's a very... Uh, rough system and you have these guys that sit there and know how to do these things and then suddenly a new technology comes in that can completely change things often that is the young guy uh, and he says that well look at this we have the technology we have the innovation and they say that well well this is how we do things so there will be need to be a breakthrough of this new technology into how we uh, plan our societies but and that has not been really successful until now, I would say. Because IT is very special when it comes to, to rapidness. Look at IT, what it has done so far. Uh, when IT comes into uh, any area so far, uh, everything seems to explode. Uh, this is Spotify. Uh, can you imagine how music was done before Spotify? Well, there was a music industry, it was called. Uh, which means that there's a lot of companies profiting fr on the artists uh, in all different ways, on, on selling, on packaging and everything. Now you can move directly from, from a, uh, a small computer like this at home with a DJ uh, onto everyone into the world. And you kind of short circuit the whole system. Uh, media, the same. Newspapers, magazines. Takes a little bit longer time, but we'll move in that direction. And you can see that large news corporations all over the world are struggling a lot with this new thing. Healthcare. We don't see it so much in Sweden as we see it in, for example, Africa or America, 
where IT is starting to short circuit what what the system used to be like that when you can get sensors in people's homes and you can get uh, uh, good uh, uh, medical advice from 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 uh, remote uh, payment systems. Uh, then we don't need to go to smartphones. We can use the SMS-based M-Pesa system in Africa that have uh, made them... Uh, you don't need banks anymore. And of course we have communication where we don't need to travel anymore to have a big meeting. You can sit at home. That is how we, uh, we worked in the Chinese assignment that I had. We had one American guy and we had one Japanese guy and then we had the Swedish guy that was me. And we worked together completely seamlessly. It was only the, the, the time zone thing that you had to solve there. So you can see that we had a meeting that when, the, when the American guy had a cup of tea, I had a, a beer and he had a, a cup of coffee because we were in the morning or evening or, or at the middle of the day situation. But uh, working like that is, is really a good thing to do. And then of course, uh, IT is breaking through in all these, but what will happen now when IT breaks into cities? Uh, when I started to realize this was when I was invited to, uh, this was a very humble uh, title of a meeting. It was called Meeting of the Minds in in US. It was uh, a meeting where they tried to, to gather a lot of urban thought leaders, as they said. And they invited me, and uh, I got to listen to a lot of interesting perspectives on, on how things are done. This is the mayor of Vancouver, he was there. Uh, this is the mayor of San Francisco that said that, well... What we see is that uh, mayors and, and cities' administrations have a completely different role in the future. We're not the ones that are going to take a lot of papers and stamp them and, and give permits. We have to share information with everyone as quickly as possible and open up all our data about the city. If we do that, we will spur innovation and we will have sustainable development. So they are reshuffling the administration of San Francisco. They have uh, assign the chief information officer, chief innovation officer, that are central to the city development now, instead of working in the old silos. This was a very influential guy. Uh, this is Colin Harrison from IBM. He was the chief architect for uh, the Smarter Cities program and the Smarter Cities concept that they came up with. And he was the one that, that formulated the idea that we are working now and, and we are moving around in, in clouds of data that we haven't really realized what you can do with. Uh, we have realized it in different silos. We're working with, as I said, smart healthcare, smart transportation, and all these things. But what happens when you connect all them together? Well, that reconnects to my image with the city and the smart city. Because if you can start to make energy, waste, and water to be interconnected and controlled together, that is, that is just great opportunities for how you can start to buffer energy in buildings. You can start to maybe uh, lower the water in, in, the, in the water systems before you, you can see that the storm is coming and so on. All these things can start to work together. And uh, I was invited to this year's meeting on the mines as well in Toronto. And I just come from there. And what we learned there was that uh, things are happening now. Uh, Last year, we were talking about the, the, the potential, uh, the numbers, and you can see that they are large. And you can also see that the implementation of Internet of Everything or Internet of Things is happening really fast. And it will drive a lot of innovation, it will drive corporate profits. You can see that the, the, the speed of adoption of digital infrastructure in the city is five times faster than, than the last big implementations of infrastructure, which was electricity and te telephones. Uh, so this is happening fast, but we're still really low on, on the implementation, but it's happening really fast. And we can also see that the large potential is in, in manufacturing, in industry. It is within the public sector, it is within energy, healthcare, and transportation. We made a study visit to, to one of the companies that are really influential, and that is Cisco. Cisco had an a innovation center there called Smart and Connected Communities. And that is a lab where they test all these things and try to package them. So they were working here with buildings. And they have put up uh, a lot of uh, space for sensor makers, sensor uh, manufacturers to come and just test their sensors with a lot of other sensors. So if you're doing a fire alarm or, or a lock system, you can connect it here into this backbone system 
which is then driven of power over Ethernet. And then you can start to interact with the other sensors. You can test, for example, if you get a fire. You can, can shut down the water, you can turn off the lights, you can send an alarm to an iPad in another uh, part of the building. You can also compile a lot of this data into uh, planning uh, tools. So that's one way of, of how this is happening. They're starting to think about buildings as, as uh, computers. And then, of course, you need an operating system. So this is one of the first operating systems for buildings. Bu a building OS that is coming now, where you can also run the building, so to say, from this iPad, for example. Uh, and when it comes to social sustainability, it's interesting to see that they are also getting on the train here. Uh, this is a, a concept that was called the Remote Expert Government Service. And there was no new technology in this. It was just filled with, with typical things that we use today. There was a video conference unit, there was a document scanner, there was a printer, and and uh, all these things. But the package was that you can now move these ones out to, to shopping malls or, or petrol stations to get people to interact with, uh, uh, with the government. Which also means that, for example, if you live in a remote area, you can always access government services very conveniently. If you're an old lady that needs to have a uh, permit filled out, well, you can go in and just show it to the camera and they can help you fill, fill it out and print it. And, uh, if you come as a refugee from Syria, you can go in here and be connected to a, a Syrian-speaking government official, which will also make things very much more convenient and, and accessible. And th this, the w it was really the package and the business case that was the new thing here. So businesses are moving ahead, and they're realizing that this will actually be something completely new. There are other very positive signs at the moment, and, and I'll just spend a, a few minutes talking about this slide here. Uh, this slide I got from, from uh, Thomas Kåberger. You might know him, he's working a lot with renewable energy. He, he used to be a professor at Chalmers. He's now working with both Japan and China with uh, their transition towards renewable energy. And it has to do with, usually these the graphs are the, the pollution graphs, the bad graphs, but these are the good graphs. And they show that the, the, the speed of implementation of renewable energy is, is really unprecedented. And it couldn't really be predicted. He said to me that he, he tried to find studies that predicted this high rise in, in solar and wind uh, energy capacity. And just two, three years ago, no one could really predict that this was going to happen. And it is driven by China and, and Germany mainly, also US in part. But uh, Germany has taken a lot of cost for this, so we can really be thank thankful to them for, for this speeding up. And China is also putting a lot of money into uh, public money and funding into this transition. So country by country, we can now see that renewable energy is competing and getting cost parity with fossil fuels. Uh, Australia, uh, Brazil, uh, many other countries are reaching uh, this point. And you can imagine what will happen with energy supply when you're re reaching that point. You don't need politics, you don't need policy. You just need a, a healthy business environment, so to say. And the, the trend in sustainable business is also continuing. This is a, a new report from Verdantix that says that in UK now, sustainable business is growing 20 times faster than UK GDP in 2012. That is a prediction, and the last numbers I saw, it was probably turning out to be true. Uh, to summarize here, wh why, why is this so important? Why, why do smart machines and, and smart and connected systems contribute to sustainable development? Well, it has to do with really uh, basic things like being efficient with our resources. You can optimize systems, you can, can control systems here. So it's not only one-way communication about reading from a meter that is smart. You can also control the systems and steer them together. And by then, you integrate and create synergies. And this is the this is where Swedes are, are world champions. We are really good at, at cooperating across borders, Spe especially in science, but also in, in, in society. That is why we are the ones traveling around the world talking about sustainable cities and not the Chinese and not the, 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 the American guys. And as I said, it saves money. Uh, one way of reducing emissions is to, for example, control buildings. Uh, if we take the system of buildings and energy and connecting them together, we can see that 
um, a lot of the, the emissions from energy is on the top. It's where you, need, where you get a cold day and everyone puts on their heaters. If you are able to control the individual heating in buildings as a system, for example, you can buffer a lot of these effects. So if you know that it's getting cold, you can just tune up the heat in all the buildings a very small degree, and then it can buffer the change in weather instead of doing it the other way around as the building reacts to the cold weather and, and starts to put up emissions in, in, in energy. It has to do with security and accessibility for people and linking people to the system. There was a big discussion in, in, in the, at the Toronto meeting now about data security. And I told them that, well, you know, Swedes, we're a bit, uh, we're a bit affected by the, the, the Snowden thing here, that, that uh, you are controlling the data and you're reading all the data. So who has actually control of all this information? Uh, and they seemed surprised. They didn't think that we were caring about that. But they also showed examples of, for example, in buildings, if you have seven different systems of information, it's a hell of a lot more mess than, than having one backbone system which you can con control in, in a better way. And also, if the data is open, which they are aiming for in the US, uh, you get all this in, uh, innovation and control from people. You, they also show that uh, the, the, the term surveillance, where, where authorities can, can survey people, is turning upside down when you get surveillance, they call it. Uh, and they took example from the Arabic Spring, where people were running around with video cameras connected to the net for, with BAM user, and they could actually identify uh, policemen's uh, uh, doing bad things to people, and they could, could monitor the authorities in the other way around. So we also need to have, th have that data security perspective, and, and the only trend I see in the long term is, is open data here. So are we moving in the right direction when it comes to sustainable development? Well, actually we are. When it comes to, to cars, there's a good analogy, thinking about the, the bad black car and the good green car here. Uh, the black car is still in the lead, definitely. Uh, but we also see that these cars are getting better and better, and they are uh, now being implemented in a higher speed. You can affect it with, with politics, as they do in Norway. In Norway now, the... the fastest selling car in August was the Tesla Model S, uh, more than any other fossil fuel cars. In Sweden, we're still not out of the, the starting blocks when it comes to electromobility. But the trend is all in, in the same way. So we are definitely moving in the right direction when it comes to sustainable development. Uh, the trends are really clear there. But as I said, the, the one major time limiting factor here is climate change. We have maybe about 20, 30, 40 years at a maximum before we need to, to have made, made this shift. So the speed of this car is really important. Can we make it before the finish line? Well, not yet, I would say. Not looking at the trends at the moment. But the IT has just come up as, as a game changer for, for sustainability. And I think when that really gets hold of it, it can short circuit this car and it can pass it on the finishing line over here. So there is hope, and you are actually one of my biggest hopes here, that you will, you will spur innovation and contribute to this a lot. And uh, to just show that technology is really an important piece, uh, I will finish off with showing you this uh, commercial for, for a, a very good car here. electric, zero gas, Nissan Leaf. Innovation for the planet. Innovation for all. So that is the car I have uh, at home at the moment and I just bought and it's working really, really good. Technology is here. We can just do it. Thank you, everyone.